Hello, I'm Charles Clausen, your host of the Ampex Podcast, a show where we engage in conversations with entrepreneurs and innovators whose wild ideas and exponential thinking are reshaping the universe where we live, play, and work. I believe these powerful conversations will inspire you to pursue your dreams. So welcome, Steve. Thank you, Charles. We're excited to have you today. Um, this is a very special guest. Steve McGuire is um, an adventurer, <laughs> yeah. um, a teacher, an innovator, a bike builder, and he just has amazing stories. So Thanks. we're going to talk about his adventures in life and um, blend it in with technology and innovation and um, well, we'll have a lot of fun with this. Yeah, I'm looking forward to a conversation. So yeah. I always like to start, Steve, with the early years. Um, uh, I mean, you have a wild spirit and an innovator and a creator on so many different fronts, but what inspired you when you were younger to have this creative spirit and to, to be this adventurer who does it? amazing things in nature you know it's it's interesting I, so I mean everybody asks themselves uh, we're always trying to update uh, how we got from here to here and things that you know jump out are when I relate to people anecdotes uh, you know these are some of the things so uh, when I was young growing up in Kansas City we lived in a very urban area so kind of really inconsistent with the places that I uh, go to and, and love to be in right now. Uh, but we, the school, Catholic school, St. James, didn't have a library. And my father agreed to put together a library. And my parents discovered in the process of my brother and I working with my dad that I was really fascinated by uh, geography and geology. Those were the books that, for whatever reason, I felt really compelled. Uh, you know, interestingly, uh, there were two other things that probably, uh, that I can see just have this uh, almost direct line to, you know, what I'm going to do today, go ride my bike and try some things out. And, you know, one of those is... Um, the fact that my grandfather was an artist. And so both of my grandparents uh, were deaf. Uh, it made going to the store easier for my grandmother uh, if I was with her, and so I stayed there a lot. And I did at night what my grandfather did, and that is paint and draw, so that at an early age, I painted and drew. And somewhere along the way, um, Early on, I got this idea that when I would get a picture in my head, I would really want to make it happen. And, uh, you know, to my parents and particularly my mother's, uh, people referred to my mom as St. Betty. I, I pulled off some things that were probably not what would normally happen. I figured out a way to land safely jumping from a third-story roof of a building. <laughs> uh, I figured out, uh, you know, different things early on. And, uh, and then at the age of uh, 13, we were moving from the inner city to the suburbs. And uh, I decided, that, well, the other thing you should know is we never had a car until I was 13 years old. And so we took a bus everywhere or we walked. But when I was 13 and we moved, it was 20 miles away. And I went to my parents with a proposal that I would ride my bike to school. And, you know, looking back and thinking, uh, 1971, 72, uh, not only was that not usual, but kids my age just didn't do that. <laughs> and I was really intrigued by uh, creating a route to get from where I was to this long distance of this other place. And so 
I, uh, I set about doing a route and I rode my bike to school. Navigated all the traffic. I, you know, went through the maps and um, I was just really taken by the whole uh, sense of exploration uh, along the way. Everything was different. Things that uh, were apparent, weren't apparent in a car, were really apparent on my walk or my ride. And so, you know, there was that piece. Um, as I went through school uh, to get an art degree, uh, I was still really uh, you know, consumed with this idea of making images happen so that I would get a picture in my head and I would want to make it happen. Um, and I would, I would uh, obsessively uh, pursue these things to a level that uh, I didn't think of in terms of that other people weren't doing, but in terms of what was required to make it happen. Uh, so the first time, for instance, I went to the Iditarod Trail, in 1995, um, there was no internet, there was no GPS. Uh, I had read, uh, seen an image uh, in a book at Prairie Lights, and it was of a man on a bicycle in what looked like horribly extreme winter conditions. It said, <laughs> you know, 35 below zero, the Iditarod Trail. Half the participants in the race uh, uh, end up with hypothermia and frostbite, uh, toughest human powered race on the planet. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that be something if a guy could do that? But there was, I didn't know how you did this. And so I set about going through interlibrary loan, getting in a phone book, calling people in Alaska, so that uh, by the end, I found a guy who manufactured really wide rims at the time, 50 millimeters, matched it to a 2.5 or 2.2 inch tire, called um, uh, a guy who outfitted mushers to figure out an efficient light system, uh, went to the library uh, at the university in special collections and got as many of the topo maps for the area that I could. And I studied uh, the route uh, obsessively. So you knew the route before you even started. You almost probably had memorized. The I, route. I did. The eleven hundred miles is that about what it is? I didn't go the full distance that year. It was only two hundred and twenty-five miles. And this was in ninety-five. January, what what month? It was in. Uh, it was February nineteenth, nineteen ninety-five. February nineteenth. So the weather conditions in Alaska at this time. I'm assuming it was at or below zero. It was. Fahrenheit. It got down to forty below, and um, I, uh, I was I was really prepared to do it. I I remember trying to figure out different boot systems, but finally just settled on hundred below Cabela boots. They were huge. Uh, they were heavy to pedal, but they worked. And uh, you know, looking back now, I wouldn't even ride that bike. Two inch tires is not even yeah, big enough to two, play. Two, I wouldn't do that at all right now. Uh, but at the time, that's that's what was available. And I uh, I pushed my bike and I made it. And uh, like all the times before, that whole sense of being consumed by a goal and making this picture in my head happen, uh, just, you know, I added to that. And you begin to add knowledge. I, you know, this summer I, we took a trip uh, from north to south in Iceland through the highlands. And um, I discovered something that uh, I didn't anticipate that I've probably al always done uh, in the process. And that is, I had memorized the whole route everything about it, where there were different lava fields, the stories behind, the saga pieces behind uh, particular geographical locations, 
every water crossing. Uh, and it, it came in handy because, as it turned out, uh, the um, this was an unseasonably cold year in Iceland, the coldest summer maybe on, on record for them as long as they've kept uh, contemporary records. And the, um, the Highland roads uh, in the Central Highlands hadn't opened yet, and so we needed to create, or I needed to figure out uh, whether or not the route I had planned was going to be good or we should take a, a different kind of route. We took a different kind of route, but the fact that I had looked at this whole thing, understood it, began to conceptualize it, I hadn't thought about the fact that I do that all the time. And um, So that's, that's, that's pretty cool because you, you study an area, you know the history, Oh yeah. You know the geography, um, you know the geology. You probably know the plants, the animals, and everything about it. So when you show up, and Mother Nature decides to throw a twist, you can improvise because yeah. it's like you've been there. You know the land. You know the weather. You know the likely outcomes given what's going on, and you can just in your subconscious plan a new route that is more in sync with nature and where she is in her cycle and I mean that's that's fascinating that um, you know it, 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 it can save your life too in a lot of situations because you you know what's coming before you get there yeah that's right I mean you know I, I research the technology around clothes uh, human physiology so I know those things but at the end of the day you know, one of the most basic elements that's necessary is not to identify with your thoughts in the moment. It's just really, really critical. So, um, you know, I knew the trail this summer. I actually knew the trail, you know, back in 1995. But the thing that enabled me most wasn't that knowledge. It was the idea that, on the one hand, I was compelled by wanting to accomplish the goal. On the other hand, in the moment, I could see myself thinking, and I knew uh, what I didn't need to pay attention to and what I needed to pay attention to. And so that relationship um, with what's going on in your head is probably the most critical Thing that I have as I'm older because you know I can't do things as fast as I did with when I'm younger I'm you know much weaker uh, you know strength wise but I know how to finish and I know how to finish because I know uh, that what I'm conscious of doesn't feel bad or good I'm just conscious of it and the, th the thoughts about oh I'm really fast right now are this is horrible, I'm never gonna make it. I know that those things aren't real. I know that there's a, you know, so that, that helps me now. So you're, you're very good at being totally present in the moment, totally focused on the moment, but not letting memories and fears and other things come into your mind and in your flow state and you're, you're more enjoying it. Just to put things in perspective for our audience, we're in a, a major winter blizzard today. Um, <laughs> it's going to impact 60 million people. Denver, they're talking oh, yeah. about having yeah. the coldest temperatures in over 40 years, um, 30 to 50 mile an hour winds. And, you know, it's been snowing all night. And Steve rode his fat tire bike to our, our meeting today. So you can see Steve around... Iowa City, 365 days a year. It doesn't matter what's going on. It can be 100. It can be 10. He's out on his bicycle, and it's what, what's it like when you spend that much time outside in the elements in nature? Um, I'm assuming mm -hmm. it's almost like a, a moving meditation where you kind of just become one with where you are and what you're doing, and you're just observing. Yeah. And um, maybe thinking. So I, I should say, I actually drove here. 
But oh, you I'm, drove today. But I'm going to ride after this. I had to go do a bunch of errands, and I thought, I'm going to do that because it takes so long to get ready. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to okay. do that event. But, you know, in terms of being um, nature, uh, you know, these are some of the things. One is that um, it, there's a very simple strategy for me when things are difficult, and that is I raise my head up, and uh, my vision literally changes my brain in that second. So everything comes in. So all of a sudden, uh, all the thoughts in my head about the circumstances, the temperature, whether I should turn around, am I prepared enough, I don't need to push this, uh, should I change wheels, is this the the right setup for the event. Uh, all that all that thinking goes away the second I lift my head up. And so I, when I catch myself thinking, I lift my head up and everything just pours in. And whether or not I want it to or not, uh, all of nature is present at that moment. And, uh, you know, the, the, the voices, the thinking in my head, uh, really begin to to uh, subside. And there's a sense in which uh, it's a kind of, uh, there's some interesting research about nature and what it does to the brain. And um, we're wired to have a relationship with nature. Uh, we're wired to be able to be changed by nature that's our that's who we are that's our relationship and uh, it's pretty incredible to me to discover that as uh, technology advances and we're all immersed in it we're actually learning how to be in nature better in, in a sense we're knowing more what what's going on the science about uh, humans in nature is uh, is vast. Reading alone doesn't uh, capture what's available to us, but experience does. So if you set side by side contemporary research on human physiology and being in nature with actually doing it, you can leverage what it's like to be a human almost more completely. And so right now, the thing that one of the things that's fascinating to me is uh, our reality is we're always in, always nearly in cyberspace. Uh, if we're not on the internet, we're probably contemplating uh, pursuing information that we know is available or could be available. And so we're thinking of that at least as a tool, and that tool itself uh, is, is shaping us. And yet at the same time, uh, for many people, and I believe that in endurance races, uh, at this particular moment in time, we're able to set these two things up dialectically so that I can experience what it's like to be obsessive, ruminate, uh, driven to answers on the internet. And I can also know what it's like, what it feels like to have that dissolve and uh, while being in nature. And I can know from science why it's important to do these things and then or to, to be in nature, and then I can go out and experience it, and I can add it to a knowledge base and understanding. So, you know, there's a sense in which doesn't matter if we're scared or we're elated about uh, the great singularity in 2042. Right. It's going to happen. But just like everything else uh, in the past, we're 
we're, we're going to change as humans, but we're not going to change as humans. Uh, that's, that's my sense. Right. So this is, um, this is fascinating. So when you, you lift your head up, Steve, and nature flows in, I'm, I'm sensing that that's kind of a oneness where you become yeah. connected with something bigger than your ego, your eye. You become connected with nature and all that is. And yeah. um, there's immense um, energy and, and life force in the universe. So, you know, sometimes when I meditate, um, if you go deep enough, you actually feel a pulsing of energy. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really kind of the life force in the universe, but it's, um, I think from a creativity, innovative standpoint, when you get into that oneness and you are totally present and you're not being manipulated by prior experiences or fears or yeah. outcomes on what should be, that's when true innovation happens. Things will pop into your consciousness. That's right. Why don't I do this? Or what about that? Yeah. Or you create a new vision of something else you want to do that you it just comes to you through being present in that moment, and it's um, I you know what's what's happened. What's really it's fascinating to me, and it also gives me uh, a great deal of pleasure. And I I don't know that I I call it intuition, but when I uh, you know I've learned to. Uh, be present for the experience of uh, being separate from my thoughts. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, uh, things kind of slide away. My ego kind of slides away. And when it does, just like you say, things open up. And there will be moments where I get a feeling in my body uh, that the thought that I just had actually is one worth keeping. And I would say 99% of the time that's not true, but maybe every three or four days I will have a body sensation when I'm out doing stuff. And I will have recognized, damn it, you're, you're lost in thought. And then I realize just being frustrated by being lost in thought is a thought. And right. then I'll, I'll just, I then, you know, I'll let that go. And then all of a sudden something will come to me and I will feel that in my body and that feels right. Uh, and, you know, maybe that's intuition, but it's not as simple as, uh, it's not as simple. There, there seems like there, there's a period where I see what's going on and uh, things line up. Uh, so it's almost like in those moments that the the truth, the real truth, yeah. and the clarity, yeah, is crystal. I mean, it's it's there. It's yeah. obvious, and it's it's something that you can accept. And you know, if you're in your ego, um, your fears come in, and your big eye comes in, and you know, you're you know, it's about me, and it's about this, but. So often, yeah. it's about something bigger. And when you can be with such laser attention and focus that you're totally in the moment, you're not distracted by thoughts. And, yeah. You know, back in the, the early days of the human species, when a saber-toothed tiger jumped out of yeah. the tree, you were focused on survival. And humans are not good at exponential thinking. We're, we struggle sometimes with linear thinking yeah, <laughs> because we we over we often overwhelm ourselves, and we have so many thoughts. You know, we've been programmed in school, and you know, in our religious beliefs, and you know, our family, our cultures, our traditions. And by the time you lay all these boundaries and these expectations, and what I'll call programs, you almost paralyze yourself. And when you get when you lift your head, and oh. nature flows in, and you become one with just the universe and it's a different experience. And I, I think um, it'd be worth talking a little bit about there's so many people that spend so much of their time on the internet and you know, web three and the metaverse coming that I think they've lost 
their connection with nature and then they worry why, I mean, they become more anxious, they become depressed. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's the pharmaceutical companies make so much money on antidepressants and uh, anti-anxiety med medicine, but it really doesn't help. It's the connection with nature and the connection with other human beings that I think gives us sanity right. um, um, amidst all this crazy exponential change where everything is um, being reshaped. So, you know, the, um, the podcast is all about talking to innovators and their wild ideas that are reshaping the universe, right. not the, the earth or the world, the universe where we live, work, and play. I mean, right. Elon's working on, you know, how to colonize Mars and space. So our, our reality is much bigger than mm. most people can get to with their limited thinking. But you know, how do you, if you can stay connected with nature and you can keep human connections with other humans without getting overwhelmed, your experience in life is so much different. And I, I wonder, um, I don't know how many hours a week you spend on your bike, but it's significant. And you know, what happens if that went away? How would, you mean, what would happen to Steve? I mean, and your creativity and your innovation and just everything yeah. that you're doing on so many different fronts. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know um, what it would be like. Um, but there will be a time where, where that's not happening. And I'd like to think that uh, I'm acquiring, by being on my bike, the kind of uh, experience that will allow me to be okay when I'm not on it in the future. Uh, you know, right now I'm, you know, pretty focused on making sure that um, I continue to pursue the kinds of experiences that, uh, you know, are value added for, for more than me. I'm 64 years old and now it's not so much I think in terms of a legacy as much as I, I realize that I can connect a certain bunch of dots and configure them in such a way that um, I can I can leave a value that otherwise wouldn't be available in the world, and that maybe that's my purpose. And so, you know, realizing my purpose right now is, you know, every day it's it's there are little incidents, there are experiences that happen, but. I know that it's it's connected to understanding how I am uh, shrunk by the immensity of everything around me. I have since you know being a real young kid, really taken by um, the feeling of being out in the middle of nowhere, and and just realizing that. Any psychological maneuvering means nothing, and I. So I'm trying to learn from that. And then, you know, right now, uh, I'm not Elon Musk. I, I I don't know much about Mars. I know that he's having a hell of a time with Twitter. <laughs> um, Sometimes you got to be careful what you wish for. <laughs> yeah, uh, but you know, for me. Uh, you know, I have this 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 arena that I'm uh, working in, and uh, some of that reaches, you would say, broader than others. But I teach at the university. I uh, am an administrator of a large art school, very good art school, with uh, about sixty faculty and staff and hundreds of students. And I think really purposefully about what's required of me, not for that position, but in terms of continually uh, updating my experience in order to make it a, a, a good adventure for them and for me. And, you know, specifically I teach uh, a bicycle frame building program that I didn't anticipate when it started would, would become uh, such an important vehicle for individual students. 
I was really just thrilled. We had a woman come through who became the first woman to engineer a mountain bike for Trek. Uh, somebody that won a North American hand-built bike show. Uh, but more than that, I like to think that there are over 300 people out in the world who have a bicycle. They're either on it now or they're protecting it uh, by not putting it on their porch and keeping it in their house that they, that they built themselves. And uh, the experience of transforming an idea into a drawing and a drawing into an object, an object that interfaces with your life mm -hmm. is exactly the kind of experience that we need, I think, uh, to be able to, I don't want to say navigate, but to successfully believe, be in the reality of that, that surrounds our lives in terms of cyberspace, potentially, uh, the metaverse. I'm getting ready to go to um, the University of Arkansas and then the University of California, Santa Barbara, where you know the idea is they're going to make programs like this that uh, put together art and engineering students uh, to build handmade bicycles. And I was talking to uh, my counterpart at the University of Arkansas who's bringing me there, and he said, we're just... We're, People are so excited. I had no idea, you know, they, that you're coming here. And we got a call from um, uh, Crystal Palace asking if you would you would do a presentation there. And I went home and I told my wife, God, I can't believe this. This is really going to be so cool. And the thing that's going to be so cool is not just that I'm doing it, but that I'm going to be in a position to have to think a little bit and understand better what it's been what's been going on and I I think that um, so right now you know I'm really interested in uh, building out the bicycle program at the University of Iowa so that uh, students and faculty have this experience of making an object that is uh, a lifetime object that uh, can put them in the world. I, you know, people ask me, uh, "What's the difference between the last bike that you made and and uh, the bicycle that you just got done making uh, today?" And I say, right. "A half an inch." And <laughs> and they look at me and I say. The thing that, that's going on is um, I understand something different about the place that I ride with the bicycle that I made and the place that I ride critiques what it is that I made so that there's an ongoing conversation. And these little bit of differences uh, and these changes uh, in uh, geometry uh, they not only propel me, but uh, they enhance my relationship with what I'm doing and with being outside. Uh, you know, I'm looking at the snow today, and I'm literally thinking, 18-inch chain stays, 20-inch chain stays. Uh, uh, inch longer cockpit. How does this? How does this feel in the snow? And uh, that's a thinking relationship. And then I remind myself, when I get out there, it ain't going to matter. The only thing that's going to matter is to put one foot in front of the other. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, it's, um, it's a beautiful thing, the, um, the experience to come up with an idea, to design it, to build it, then have it take you on adventures, whether you're riding gravel roads, you're riding single track, whether you're riding the Iditarod, the students get an opportunity. They have pride in what they built yeah. and probably more motivated to go out and actually use it. But those, those simple nuances of how the relationship with your body with the bike and space. You know, yeah. I'm a big guy and I have some neck injuries and I've got um, a bike I spent six months designing with a bike builder that I'm pretty much upright like Mary Poppins. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when you're going 
hundreds of miles, um, it's a different experience on our 64-year-old bodies than when you're just riding to the grocery store. So, you know, creating a cockpit where it's comfortable yeah. and where the bike supports you, mm -hmm. um, it just makes it a lot more enjoyable. And, you're, yeah. you know, you're thinking about it since you are teaching students uh, how to create experiences and how to design something that meets their needs. Right. You have insights that you can share with them. But I think it it gives them life skills that I can have a vision that I can build it and, oh, yeah. you know, learn from it. And I think that experiential nature of what you're doing is lacking so much. I mean, you can only get so much from reading a book or going out and scanning yeah. the internet. At some point, you got to just roll up your sleeves and do it. So let's spend, a, let's spend a few minutes and talk about the Iditarod. And once you actually get on the trail, what's the, how many times have you ridden on the trail? Just twice. And what was the longest you've gone? 350 miles. And that's what, a week? It took just under seven days. And I uh, was with a friend, a great friend, Jed Rower, who uh, I'd done it before. Uh, this was in 2019, and um, probably averaged three hours of sleep a night. It, uh, you know, a good temperature range. It was at times, uh, I think the warmest it was was on the last day, and it probably was 20 degrees. And the coldest it was was about minus 39 degrees. And... Um, You know, it was uh, it was a really great uh, experience all the way around, and I I built a bike for it. I thought very very purposefully about it. I the bicycle uh, comes apart so it could fit in two travel cases. Mm -hmm. I um, I trained a lot, but. Training uh, was set side by side with uh, the knowledge of what might happen and then also the insight uh, not to be consumed by fear or worry. Um, the experience itself uh, was, well, you know, so for instance, the first day, um, there's a great, a great photo of Jed and I looking out over uh, uh, a flatland area basin, really uh, the, the, uh, the basin for the uh, uh, Yentna River. And we started out kind of warmish, I think it was, you know, 10 degrees, which is a decent temperature because things stay the trail stays pretty good, and then it was really tore up, and then the temperature dropped almost 30 degrees within an hour, and I I struggled to get an overboot uh, on, and I just had to give up and understand that it was just not going to be quite on the way that I wanted, and um, as we pedaled, uh, we could see people making snow shelters, uh, and we really wanted to get to Yentna Station. And I cramped up, and for the first time, um, I didn't try to break the cramp at all by stopping. I uh, continued to pedal. The cramp stayed for five hours, maybe. Eventually, it just went away, and uh, it hurt like hell. So on a scale of one to ten, with ten being the worst, was this you talking seven, eight, nine, or was? You know. Um, or did the pain just fade at some point after an hour? Or two? Yeah, it just stayed, and it was okay, and I knew that it was there. And the thing that 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 you learn is that nothing is permanent; it's all temporary. And every time you think about it, you realize you're thinking about it and you just move on to something else and uh, I did that over and over again for however long maybe five hours and then it, it just stopped and I um, 
you know, was buoyed by the fact that we were making significant progress. The other thing is seeing uh, that I wasn't the only one challenged, that there were other people that were in that situation. We got to Yenta checkpoint. As it turned out, uh, something like 16 people had significant frostbite and hypothermia. They weren't ready for how quick that turned on. One woman's face had just, her nose just exploded. It just was a a mess. And people were med-backed out, um, hadn't slept. And, you know, you never sleep anyway the night before an event like that. (laughs) And I think we went 42 hours without sleeping and got to the next checkpoint we slept and then uh, from there I was really buoyed by the reality that um, we were going to make it we were actually going to this was going to happen so there was no question in your mind at that point that the doubts and uncertainty we made it through this stretch of unbelievable challenges from other nature and we did it yeah I rolled over and I told Judd third day that I said, I don't know if I can do this. I just, wow, I just, I don't think I can do this. And he said, dude, remember our agreement? No decisions before sun up. And so, (laughs) and sun came up and he goes, so what do you think? And I said, about what? And he said, oh, forget it. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I love it. So the, the temperature was a challenge in the beginning. Did you have any encounters with wild animals, or were they pretty much hunkered down? And they were they were hunkered down. You know, moose are the most dangerous, and uh, we saw a herd of buffalo. I, I didn't realize that there were American bison uh, up on that trail as much as they were, but uh, there were buffalo. And problem was, we spooked them, and they took to a firmer uh, path, and that was the trail. The trail. And it was all post hold by moose, I mean by buffalo, uh, as they ran down the trail in front of us. And, uh, so what's the trail like? Is it groomed like a snowmobile trail? Or what, what, what do they do to make it easier for the bikes? So do they do really, anything? It's, it's really fascinating. It's, uh, there's a sequence. So there's what's called the Iron Horse Race, which is a uh, snowmobile snow machine Mm -hmm. uh they go out uh a week before the humans go out Mm -hmm. uh, and they break the trail for the first time and so if you've got a gps you're going to notice right away that the track that you have for maybe the from the previous year is not exactly the same as the the visible trail it, but it's going to be close enough that you're going to be able to recognize they're plow, it. they're going through it and plowing it, and they're, it's, they're yeah, not and it, looking to make sure they're in the exact that's same That's right. And so foot. they're finding, you know, the best route for the, the ground conditions at that moment. And it's going to be almost always visibly um, discernible from uh, the GPS track. So you could be on the GPS track confused, and then look and see that somebody tried to run a trail this way, or you could see that you're on a trail and the GPS extract is over here, but they're probably going to come back together. So it's it's easy to navigate. And, you know, back in '95, that didn't exist. I had a map, a physical trail map. Wow. And uh, a topo map, and I made it. And you know there. The snow machines had, uh, were obviously taking the, the trail at that time as well, as were sled dog teams. And, uh, and they, would, they would tie a piece of reflective uh, ribbon uh, at different points on the trail, especially turns. And so you had a certain degree of confidence, even if you lost uh, a visible trail and track, that you were doing the right thing and then you could you know get a sense of where you thought you were vis-a-vis uh the map that you had if you needed to but it it was really easy um i didn't think that that was the technology we had and so i didn't think anything 
other than that, now we have GPS. Everybody's required to have it. And uh, not only that, but... They can track where you are too, right? Spot tracker. Yeah. And they, so uh, you know, my wife could uh, see exactly where I was all the time. And I uh, put her in uh, contact with a good friend, uh, Leah, who uh, had done it. And Leah, if needed, could be called upon to explain why Steve and Judd are still at this spot. What might be going on? I had one to the, the, we, we got to Roan Checkpoint, which was a tent. And it was just like roller dogs. Uh, with people sleeping. So the idea was um, the last person uh, in would be, sorry, first person in, uh, depending on when you got there, the next, you know, you had to get up. So mm -hmm. if it was your time, you'd been there the longest, next person that came in, you had to get up and leave. And there was room for about seven, and there were... Uh, uh, tree boughs, pine boughs, that were uh, laid down that we could all lay side by side next to each other on. Mm -hmm. And eventually it was Judd and I's time to go. And we you know, took off, it was just after midnight, and we were crossing an area of overflow on the river. And so there was about two miles of really spooky thing of so the know, water's coming up over the top over of the, the ice top. and you had to ride through that and so what happens is it's freezing fairly instantaneously oh. but your wheel drops down through that layer onto another layer and you don't know if, if you're, you're going, going all, in the way all the way through oh, wow and so uh, Jed and I had each other in case somebody actually went in and at one point Jed said should we turn back and just wait until the light in the morning. And I said, we're almost all the way across. We're just gonna have to go back across this, you know, we have more going back the other way. Yeah. And so we, uh, we continued down the trail and we were so wired and beat up mentally from going across that, that we probably only went a couple miles on the trail. We decided we're just gonna stop here and sleep. And so we got our sleeping bags out. Bivy crawled into mine, he crawled into his. And then after a couple of hours, I heard him screaming, Steve, Steve, help me, help me. And I'm like, oh my God, what the hell's happening? And <laughs> he was, I didn't know he had sleep paralysis and he couldn't move and he's inside his body. And he thought he was being snatched by aliens oh, and wow. they were on top of him and so, so this was kind of a bad dream event. He was shaking he going Judd Judd and he's so your body is awake but your I mean your mind's awake but your body is frozen and when this happens and so you can't move and that not being able to move makes you think that you're being constrained by somebody and, and so, being in a like a mummy bag yeah. <laughs> and so um that was entertaining, and uh, but you know the adventure was really great, and being with somebody uh, on that is 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 everything um, in terms of uh, you know uh, friendship and, and knowing people. It seems like from a survival standpoint, if you did it by yourself and anything happened, you're by yourself. At least with your someone else, you can work oh, yeah. together as a team and navigate and you know discuss things and figure out how to help each other yeah we we came up with i mean judd is uh you know he's an engineer uh, at sandia labs he uh engineers radar technology uh he uh, has been working on the technology that's used uh for radar to penetrate uh coverage mm -hmm. of uh, fauna on the you can know, see through so he's he's incredibly uh, gifted when it comes to navigation uh, but we also agreed and I, I do this a lot when I'm with people uh, on adventures or events and that is agree uh, up front about um, 
how we'll handle different situations. And so what we did was if we ever had uh, a question about whether or not we were on the trail and going the right way, I would defer to him regardless, and I would just keep my mouth shut. And um, unless he really wanted, you know, some input, me to look at it. Otherwise, we would have been standing there in the cold trying Debating. to figure out what, what to do. And because you're never going to, you're always going to, if you don't have a doubt um, that's real, you've got one that's being created in your head. And that never works um, in a situation like that. And as it turned out, it, it paid off. And, you know, we knew two other people who, all four of us are standing there. Uh, we had caught up to them, and they were trying to figure out which way to go. And uh, they thought one way, and Jed said, I think it's this way. And uh, and so we didn't even talk about it. I went that way, and they had extra miles, as it, as it <laughs> turned out. But uh, well, What happens when you veer off the normal um, trail that the snowmobiles pack down, and you just start... Is the snow crusty? Will it support the bikes? If yeah, you just for the take most off? part. Yeah, it, it will. Uh, but that's one way to tell that you're not on the trail. So one of the great, um, one of the things, you, you, you what can happen is you can go off the trail three inches and you can be completely buried in the snow. Um, that's usually not the case on a river system, uh, but because uh, a lot of it is blown. So you're riding up the riverbed with the frozen yeah, ice underneath? You're, yeah, you're, you're, you know, in the Iditarod Trail, like the Arrowhead Trail in, in northern Minnesota, uh, is not a, a trail until the winter uh, because it has to be, you know, it has to include the, the frozen rivers. And so you're on river and lakes a lot. So... Are those rivers and lakes frozen solid, or is there hot springs that come up, and is there weak spots? I mean, do people go through the ice? Yeah, they go through the ice. And, you know, it was well below zero, and there were streams that were not frozen. And it's just because, because they move so fast? They move so because fast. they had warm water? It's, it's they're moving so fast. You know, so back to how this, how this race happens in terms of the trails. So... Snow machines go out, they make the trail. The humans on foot and bike, mostly some ski, uh, follow. Uh, they actually firm it up in a, in a particular way that's more advantageous to dogs and sleds. Mm -hmm. And then a week later, the sled dogs start. And what's really good for the humans is that uh, in preparation for the uh, dog race, uh, the Iditarod crew will go out on snow machine with sleds and they'll have branches and the like. And where there's a stream, they'll lay this uh, across the stream and they'll let the frozen water come over the top and it becomes solid mm -hmm. and it helps create uh, a little bit of a bridge. And so we were... Uh, by the time we, we started to hit that, uh, we, um, in Hell's Gate, we, we were, it had already been laid down. We, the, the Iditarod team had already gone ahead of us. Trouble with that is snow machines really muck up the trail. So it's rough. It's really rough, That's if like you can pedal at all. I think we probably pedaled only half of the 350 miles we walked to rest. Oh, my. I know. We oh were on my. single speed bikes. Uh, I've always used a single speed. Is that because there's person. less that can go wrong? Less that can go wrong, but uh, mentally, you're always in the right gear. You can't change. <laughs> oh, there's no choice. There's no choice. So what's when you're riding, are you averaging four or five miles an hour? Or is that too much? I mean, if you're walking, <laughs> that's going to slow. Yeah. You know, I think about seven miles an hour and the riding part. Interestingly, this summer, we were going through the ice field in Iceland. Uh, there were times we were going 
much, or not the ice field, the, the lava field, we were going much slower than we were in Alaska. There was a day where we averaged 4.3 miles an hour. And, Doing uh, a lot of pushing? A lot of pushing and uh, not as much as, no, I, I would say not nearly as much as Alaska. It was just the terrain was so hard to ride on and the winds were incredible. Uh, we had what I learned was, what I learned a meeting of, a yellow alert uh, in, the, in the central highlands, and that was we had sustained winds over 89 miles an hour for 18 hours. The good thing is we made it to a hut, and probably riding the worst we experienced was 70 miles an hour, and then that passed. But the highlands... Uh, in Iceland are notorious for their winds. It's just they're incredible. I mean, if it hits you from the side, that can slam you down if you're not careful, right? Because you got might have to lean a little bit into a 70 mile an hour crosswind. So the probably, you know, every you know, winter's a, a deadly situation and things can happen. But in terms of being in jeopardy. Um, you know, maybe Iceland was one one thing that happened in Iceland could have been, um, you know, the sketchiest, and that was uh, I knew we were going to go across five major river crossings, and I knew that um, you know it, it could be a challenge, not so much to get across, but if you fell in and. Lo and behold, I fell in. And I didn't go submerged all the way. It came up to about my chest, laying down. And I'd gotten somebody's bike across, uh, or I'd gotten my bike across, came back to get somebody else's bike. And, and you were dripping wet. And it was 36 degrees, and it was raining. And uh, the potential... A potential shelter was um, uh, 12, 16 hours away. Mm. And then uh, absolutely no traffic because the roads hadn't opened yet. And even road is, is, uh, is uh, you wouldn't call it a road in a lot of places. But uh, the other was the wind it was picking up and so Setting up a tent was was potentially uh, going to be a challenge. Yeah, and so wow. I I tried to figure out, you know, what to do, and then I also felt really responsible for uh, all the decisions I made uh, vis-a-vis their impact on the other. Uh, five people that were, were, were in our crew. And what I decided to do, and it turned out okay, obviously I'm here. Um, I took off the pants, the, the rain pants that I had that were blocking the wind. And I uh, allowed my uh, wool uh, long underwear uh, to be exposed, and then I um, opened up my um, rain jacket, and I had a wool top on. I then um, made sure that I kept uh, the water in my shoes, and I used uh, seal skin bags uh, around my feet with with water in them and my wool sock on, and then my shoe over that. And um, from experience in winter events, I knew that that water would eventually, especially relatively warm, 36 degrees. It warms up. Could warm up. And I uh, allowed um, the wool fibers to do what wool does, and wool literally changes when it's wet and uh, in terms of the retention of heat. And over the course of the day, uh, 
my clothes eventually dried. Uh, it would rain on and off, but eventually uh, the dry wore out. Uh, my feet were always wet because we went through so many crossings. We went through five that day. And by the, we were about five hours from, or no, five miles from uh, this hut. Iceland has huts through the central highlands that are really for trekking, uh, trekkers from Europe, but they're used by multiple people. And I'd had no experience with them in the past, and I was not familiar with uh, whether or not they would be available and actually open. Uh, especially since the roads were closed. And uh, so I, you know, we were convinced, but regardless, we were going to get in one way or the other. <laughs> uh, but um, about five miles out, a friend's chain broke. Uh, the winds had picked up considerably, 50, 70 miles an hour. And trying to figure out what to do, uh, we were really cold, um, it was raining. Uh, we got it fixed, and we crossed the last uh, glacial stream before we uh, got to the hut, and it was unlocked. And the thing that was, was fascinating was, you know, we spent the night there. We left the next day. No heat, but it was just good to be out of the wind and the rain. The winds were so bad the next morning that to get water at the, at the, the glacial stream had to almost crawl. Uh, to get there, uh, it, wow. it's just incredible. But then, we we left the next day, and uh, probably about three hours into riding, we met um, uh, one of the rangers, and she was coming up for the first time to that hut in anticipation that it would open within a week. The road would open in a week, and. We said we didn't know if we were supposed to go in there or not. She said that's what it's you do for an emergency. So, so when when you were doing your research, Steve, and you were setting expectations for what this ride would be like, it's obviously in the spring and things are thawing out and the glaciers are putting a lot of cold water into the streams. What's your expectation for? This is an endurance event where you're, it's a survival event. What part of it was fun? <laughs> so least, this is really is it fun afterwards when you really look at it. Really great question. My friend James, who by the way is I mean, James Blakely, Black Sheep Bikes, one of the frame, best frame builders in the world, and he's the one that helped me really launch uh, this bike program by teaching me how to weld titanium. Uh, back in 2010 and so James and his son uh, Taryn were, were with me and James said there were three days uh, so there were uh, like how many days were out there there were s eight days of uh, live to ride and there were three days of ride to live <laughs> and um, ride to live <laughs> and you know we were worried and it's hypothermia, so a cold rain is far more deadly than um, below zero temperatures. You just cannot keep your body warm. There's, if you've got layers on, you've got enough. So for instance, uh, Arrowhead or Tuscobia, northern uh, Minnesota or northern Wisconsin, if, uh, and it happens, if the temperature is 30 below zero, you add more layers and you just you're okay and you move and moving and layers you generate and retain heat and you're okay 36 degrees in rain in a cold wind is uh is dangerous it just is dangerous because you cannot retain heat and um it actually the the the, the trip started that way and I asked myself the question you did, you know, you asked me just now, and that is, what's going to be fun about this given what just happened? And so we had started out a vacuary. We went over uh, a mountain pass, and they had uh, uh, a very unusual rain event of two inches of rain. The temperature was in the 30s. Uh, 
we were soaked to the bone. And um, we got down to the, to the bottom of, uh, of a hill. And um, I looked at everybody and everybody, you know, this is the first day and everybody's thinking, I don't want to be the person that is complaining or makes this impossible. We're just starting out. You know, uh, Steve thinks this is okay. We must be okay. But I, you know, <laughs> and I, I looked at everybody and I thought, this is a really, really, really dangerous situation. You have to find uh, shelter immediately. And so um, we stopped. I uh, asked how everybody was doing. Nobody's going to say they're doing bad. Uh, people are just shaking. They're shivering so bad. And um, so I suggested, you know, uh, put baggies, uh, dry bags over hands and feet uh, that we were going to ride really, really fast and we were going to generate heat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, we're going to switch the route. So we're going to get off. The ring road was right there. We were going to go off and we're not going to go that way. Uh, we're going to go on a ring road and we're going to ride as fast as we can to, to generate heat. And we're just going to keep going, keep going until we get to um, a gas station that's 22 miles up the road at, at uh, Godafoss. And if, if, if anything, even if there's not uh, an overnight shelter, there's a place, you know, we should be able to warm ourselves there. Mm -hmm. And uh, as it turned out, there was a house. And we went to the house and everybody had COVID. <laughs> and uh, then we figured out through uh, a broken language conversation that the school that was down the road was used in the summer as, um, as a kind of hotel dorm dormitory. And uh, we went down there, we couldn't see anybody, and then somebody opened a door. And we went in. And it was like, uh, my friend John said, okay, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God, today I came close to believing. Because uh, it just was so... Um, so if you would have stopped, you, we would be may have been... Yeah, it would really be bad. And, um, you know, ultimately, we would have flagged down a car, we would have done... You know what the ring road thankfully there is traffic and uh we would have done that um just to survive but um so at the time i thought okay well you know uh what are the chances of that i've been to iceland before never had seen a day like that it ain't gonna happen again and uh not only did it happen again it happened in, the, in probably the worst place. It, interestingly, the place that it happened, there, there's a that area right there. And I I had researched this was so in Iceland, um, it's the oldest parliament in the world. I think it was the first parliament was in 918. And um, you know people think of Vikings as barely above being a savage, that it was all, all about rape and pillage. Uh, but in reality, they were really, uh, they had, so for instance, the concept of Amsbud's person, that's, that's a Viking concept. Uh, to send somebody who's a neutral mediator with a party in case uh, everybody goes to hell in terms of confrontation. Mm -hmm. But at this one, uh, we, uh, in this, this area, was so notorious for its fickle uh, and horrible conditions that as people crossed the island to go to the All Thing uh, annually, they would go way out of their way to go down to the coast and around any other way but to go through this area. So uh, I'll, I'll mention more about that area. Yeah. So, so much of this adventure touring um, 
is mindset. Yeah. I mean, the difference between life and death is your thoughts and your ability to think clearly then to execute a plan to stay alive. I mean, it's, right. it would be so, so many people would give up and just say, no, I can't go any further. Right. Uh, and hy hypothermia is not fun. Yeah. When you start shaking and you're losing. Uncontrollably. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, so how many life threatening experiences have you had on the bike? That was really, um, the only life threatening experience that I've had. I mean, um, in the winter events, uh, I knew that I could always leave the bike exactly where it is and start walking and run to generate heat. And I would always be okay. And then I always have had, um, you know, for, for the winter events, even some you're required to have uh, a sleeping bag that's rated either between zero or 40 below zero. Uh, and then uh, either a tent or, or a bivy sack to get into. So I've always thought that um, I feel I feel pretty safe, ultimately, in terms of uh, dying. Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to be really uncomfortable. I've never gotten frostbite. Um, I, you know, I try to, you know, think eight steps. You talk about exponential thinking. You have to think exponentially when you're out doing uh, some of these things. Um, but that was really the only time. What's it like? At 40 below zero on the Iditarod Trail, crawling into a bivy sack with a 40 mile an hour wind, and it must feel like what the sled dogs do. They just dig a little hole and they curl up and they go to sleep. It, you don't want to do it. I mean, the, the reality is if you have to do that, uh, in that moment, you're behind the curve. Um, what I learned in 1995 that anybody that was on the side of the trail bivying was hurting. And so what you do is you ask if they're okay. I, I lit somebody's stove, his hands were too cold to do anything uh, in 1995. And uh, you just don't want to do it. And So when uh, it's that cold, you just keep moving? You, you don't stop? Moving. You just keep, you don't stop. You just keep moving. So what's the longest you've had to go? You mentioned 40 some hours yeah. uh, when you started that first ride. Um, yeah. Do you I ever think, have to go longer than that? I've never had to go longer than that. And um, so, you know, for instance, Arrowhead in northern Minnesota, which is probably the best event on the planet because you get to know everybody. You, It's really well organized. Uh, they're like-minded people. And um, over the years, you get to know people because all the circumstances surrounding them physiologically mean that every year at two o'clock in the morning, you're going to be with them on the trail. Might not see them any other time, but <laughs> you're both so similar that you're going to be there on the trail with them. And so you get to know them. And I, I really like that event, but, um, you know, there, uh, it's, it's start to finish, and um, if I can't ride, I push. I, I just know that uh, I just got to keep moving. I know that, you know, things are going to change. Uh, not going to die. I'm going to be maybe really uncomfortable. Uh, being uncomfortable might make me think that I might want to think that I'm going to die. <laughs> but... I'm not going to die. And uh, everything is temporary. It's going gonna, it's gonna to change in a few miles. It's hard to believe that when, when, when it's really intense and your mind is screaming out, stop. Uh, but after you do it a while, you know it's going to be okay. I, I did a race... Uh, a couple of years ago, 200 mile race in uh, a lot of sand in Michigan, and um, it was unseasonably hot. It was very, very hot, and only 16 people finished. And 
I I finished and you know I was asked so you know how did how did you finish and I'm like I'm really slow I'm old but I know how to I know how to finish I know that after I throw up I'm probably gonna feel better feel really good I know that um, there are gonna be times that I uh, am telling myself that you, you've wasted half your life doing this stupid shit. Everybody's known how crazy you are. You're a really stupid person. How could you do this? Are you trying, what are you trying to prove here? And I live with that for a few miles and then my mind is distracted and I go somewhere else and it's all gonna pass. And then somebody's gonna meet you at the end and hand you a Egg McMuffin sandwich and Later on, you're going to think that that was the best thing you ever ate in the world, and there you are. Yeah, wow. Well, that's fantastic. Um, you know, just a kind of closing, how many people along the way have you stopped and helped, and they're really struggling? They may not have made it if you didn't help them. Um, so, you know, okay, so... The, the way that I help is by staying with somebody and um, for a while and telling them that it's all going to pass. Um, you know, this would be people that are new to the experience. Um, but I don't know that I, there are uh, a lot of people. The other is, uh, you, it's, you're not going to change a lot of people's mindset. Uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so they're doubling down on whatever their com convictions yeah, or belief yeah. are, and they're not really necessarily That's open. Right. Yeah. So you just hang with them no. and keep them going. You know, it's you know one of the things that I think a lot of people in endurance events know is that who you hang with ways can really really be difficult. And I just I avoid like the plague being with somebody who is having a difficult time uh, because the difficulty is usually not with their equipment. Do I have to fix somebody's bike? Mm -hmm. uh, it's usually what's going on in their head. And uh, if that doesn't get to you in terms of fear, uh, it will be at least really, really irritating. And then you're going to be mad at yourself for being irritated with this person who's struggling. And it's just not not good to be around and that you know the you know as as things turn out um you know the whole bit of pulling people out of the river was uh you know those those things were um things that i didn't anticipate but um you know they uh I guess those were the times that I helped somebody. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. So thanks for, you know, taking the time to be with people when they need it. I um, want to also, Steve's a very humble man <laughs> and he spends a lot of time on his bike. So in Iowa, um, he's received three life-saving valor medals from three different governors mm -hmm. from pulling people out of the river that were drowning. Um, I know one of them was a mother and two children whose suburban was sinking and you and some others jumped in to help them. But, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing. You spend so much time outside in nature that huh. you see things. And when someone needs help, you stop and save their life. So that's just a, a testament to, you know, yeah. how you do good and how you're helping people when they need it. I'm teaching students how to be innovative and design things and change their lives. So I think um, this has been a fantastic uh, discussion on adventure touring and life and mindset. And um, thank you so much for your time, Steve, and look forward to our next conversation. Okay. Thank you, Charles. I, it's really fun to sit down and talk with you and um, kind of update uh, where things are right now. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on the Ampex podcast. Hope you enjoyed this episode.
Make sure not to miss future episodes and please rate the show wherever you get your podcast. Thanks to our awesome production team, Lindsay Soderberg, social and digital marketing, Taylor Higgins, video production, and Seth Nielsen, marketing. See you next time.